In this lesson, we're going to meet our next important ethicist, John Stuart Mill, and look at how he introduces quality as well as quantity into utilitarian calculations of moral value. Mill was a hugely important philosopher and has been described as the most influential philosopher of the 19th century in the English-speaking language. He was the godson of Jeremy Bentham, and his father was an intellectual and Benthamite. Mill was given a very rigorous classical education. He started learning Greek at the age of three, which precipitated a nervous breakdown when he was a young man, but he rose to be an intellectual colossus of his age. His work here um, is to defend Bentham's philosophy from its most obvious uh, attacks. One of those came from Thomas Carlyle, who described utilitarianism as a pig philosophy, because it focused simply on sense pleasure and seemed to ignore the higher goals and the higher capacities of humanity. Mill, though, didn't consider this to be a valid criticism, and he set about to explain how. He said that pleasures could be divided into higher and lower order. And he said it's quite compatible with the principle of utility to recognise that fact, and the fact that some kinds of pleasure are more desirable and more valuable than others. Mill here famously uses the example of Socrates, who is widely considered to be the founding father of Western philosophy. Mill says that it's better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. That is because Socrates, by virtue of being human, is capable of experiencing intellectual pleasures that dwarf any of the sense pleasure that a pig can experience. So, just by virtue of being Socrates, that is more pleasurable than being a pig. Even if Socrates is unhappy and the pig feels happy. This, at first, sounds counterintuitive, and you could certainly argue that it seems to run against the whole point of utilitarianism, but let's pause for a moment and consider whether or not what he's saying has some merit. We can all accept that ignorance can be bliss, and yet very few of us, so Mill argues, would want to trade places with a fool. Therefore, there must be something valuable about being intelligent, about having higher capacity uh, thoughts and emotions, than simply being a fool. My dog has a wonderful life, but I'm not sure I would swap my life with hers. So maybe Mill has a point. But he also has some explaining to do, and that is exactly what a higher pleasure is. Mill is a little bit vague here, but he says that a higher pleasure is one that people would choose even if they had an alternate choice of lots and lots and lots and lots uh, of lower order pleasure. He says also that a higher pleasure utilises the intellect, and it would be impossible to be truly happy, to be truly content, to have genuine well-being without utilising uh, our higher order capabilities. If we ever find ourselves in a position where two higher order pleasures are competing, then we should find a competent judge who's experienced both pleasures who will be able to tell us which one is best. If we can't find a competent judge, then we should get people to vote. If you think that that doesn't sound like an ideal situation, then you're probably right. And who exactly these competent judges are has been a cause of much mystery although it does sound like rather an exciting job, because you would have had to experience all different types of pleasure, both sensory and intellectual, in order to be able to give your deciding verdict on which pleasures are the most important. So, let's look how Mill's new theory alters the pre-existing Benthamite version of utilitarianism. Let's go back to the Christian in the Colosseum example. According to Bentham, the Christian in the Colosseum will want to stay alive. 
they're going to be torn apart by animals and killed for the enjoyment of others, and so they will want to stay alive. Let's say that the most amount of pleasure anyone is ever able to experience is 100 hedons. Well, the Christian's life is going to value 100 hedons. Staying alive is going to be worth that amount. It's the maximum that they can experience, 100 hedons. And let's say that the pleasure of seeing a persecuted member of a minority group being torn apart by exotic animals is worth five hedons for each person in the audience. However, because there are 50,000 people, the five hedons times 50,000 people results in a massive total of 250,000 hedons versus the miserly 100 hedons of the Christian who wants to stay alive. Therefore, according to Bentham's utilitarianism, it is going to be morally acceptable, it's going to hand out the greatest happiness for the greatest number, to kill the innocent Christian in the Colosseum. Mill, however, is going to say that the Christian's right to life is a high-order pleasure. They're right not to be persecuted, they're right not to be killed for holding beliefs that run contrary to the majority opinion, is a high order pleasure. And the pleasure of watching someone die and be torn apart is an incredibly low order pleasure. Now remember, a high order pleasure is one that you would never swap, no matter how much amount of the low order pleasure is on offer. And I think that's going to be true here. Therefore, for Mill, it is not going to be acceptable to kill the innocent Christian in the Colosseum. He has come to the exact opposite conclusion of Bentham because of his introduction of quality as well as quantity in utilitarian calculations. Indeed, protecting minority groups was really, really important for Mill. He's probably more famous for a book he published called On Liberty, in which he defends freedom of speech and, importantly, people's autonomy in all aspects of their life from government interference, so long as whatever they chose to do didn't harm anyone else. Mill, unlike Bentham, is very concerned with protecting the rights of the individual. But there are some problems with his theory. Let's look at another example. Imagine that you are the headmaster of an excellent grammar school and you've been given some money by the government now you've got a couple of options on the table in front of you and you've got to select the best one according to utilitarian calculations the first is with this new um, money you can build an all-weather football pitch which has floodlights it can be used by the school during the day after school clubs in the afternoon and the local community in the evening various different sports can be played on there including hockey and football it can be divided three ways therefore you can have something in the region of 30 people using it at any point and it can be used virtually all day in all weathers all year or you have the option to build a Japanese theatre now, kabuki is a valid and exciting art form, but it's more niche, let's say. Now, if you were Bentham, you would say the, the decision is really simple. So many more people are going to benefit by playing football, and what's the harm of playing football, right? If it gives people pleasure, then it's important. Pushpin's just as good as poetry. But if you're Mill, well, kabuki's got much more intellectual underpinning you could argue, than football. And rather than just running around getting sweaty, we can contemplate what it really means to be a human and use those high-order capabilities and capacities that Mill is so interested in. Therefore, for Mill, you could argue that you should really be building the Japanese theatre, even if very few people are going to use it. It's what they should be doing. So, in evaluation... Mill's introduction of quality to the utilitarian calculations effectively deals with the pig philosophy criticism. It prevents some of the worst excesses of act utilitarianism. If you're the Christian in the Colosseum, you're really going to support Mill. 
but it starts to become prescriptive rather than simply descriptive. By that I mean it's starting to tell people which pleasures they should like, and these should be intellectual, rather than focusing on what they actually like. And this means it starts to lose a bit of its democratic character. As a result, it's rather elitist, and it seems to embody the prejudices of an upper-middle-class, incredibly well-educated Victorian, rather than simply describing the world as it's found. And we really can ask the question, is this pure utilitarianism anymore, if it starts to um, look as though pre-existing ideas have worked themselves in, pre-existing ideas of what is valuable have worked themselves in to the theory.